Well, now it's time to talk about causal research. And again, I want to make sure we don't call it casual research. I, I'm not sure what casual research might be. It's causal research because causal research is about trying to find a cause and effect relationship uh, between two variables. And um, it tends to be primary, although not always, but it tends to be primary and it tends to be quantitative in nature um, just because we, we need uh, numerical data in order to generally establish a cause and effect. Not always, but generally speaking, that's what we're looking for. So before I begin talking about causal research, I need to talk a little bit about experimental design. Now, I, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. Um, it, is ref it, is, it is mentioned in your textbook, and I think, while I'm not wild about their description of descriptive research in the textbook, I think that their discussion of causal research is pretty good, and um, they'll walk you through the basics. So the idea of an experiment is that we are going to set up some kind of structure to understand um, if a change in something results in uh, a change in something else. So in other words, um, if I have some candy bars and I want to see how well they sell, if I put them up by the cash register, will they sell better being there than they would if they were with all the other candy bars uh, in the candy bar section of my store. So that's, that's what an experiment might set out to, to prove. And because um, experimental design can be really tricky and really nuanced, there are some different styles or different approaches that we need to take in order to um, have what we call validity in our, in our research. So let's, let's learn a few words that we need to know when we're talking about experimental design. So first of all, um, in, in an experiment, we generally have something that's called a control group and something that's called an experimental group. Now a control group is a group that we're looking at where um, they're just going through a normal experience. We're not, we're not changing anything on them. So, for example, if the normal experience is to go up to the cash register and there are no candy bars there, um, then they go up to the cash register and there's no candy bars there and they, they make their purchase and they move on. Uh, and if they want candy bars, they have to go back to where the candy bars normally are in the candy bar section of the store. The experimental group, if we're trying to learn if the presence of candy bars at the register increases sales, the experimental group will actually see the candy bars there. And they'll have an opportunity to uh, be exposed to those candy bars and we'll see if they sell better in that position than they did back in the candy bar section of the store. And what we're going to do at the end is we're going to compare what happened in the control group and what happened in the experimental group and try to understand um, did we sell enough candy bars from this display up front that it justifies saying that they're going to sell better if we put them up front where people can actually uh, see them isolated and alone as opposed to having them back with all the other candy bars in the normal spot of the store or are the sales relatively the same and therefore manipulating the placement of those candy bars doesn't really have an effect on their sales. That's what experimental design would, would try to seek out. Um, often in an experimental design, we're going to take a pretest and a post-test. So in our candy bar example, um, you know, we would generally look at both groups before we change the placement of those candy bars in the experimental group, and we would see how each group is buying the candy bars. And then um, we would manipulate our variables. So for the control group, we would leave everything the same. For the experimental group, we would move the candy bars up to the front by the cash register. And then um, we would take a post-test, which is where we take a draw after we made that change, and we would see if between our pre-test and our post-test, excuse me, a change has taken place. So um, again, this is part of, of, of good experimental design, having two different points of data that we are comparing from two different points in time. When we conduct an experiment, we're, we're really looking for two different types of what we call validity. Now, validity is, is what tells us if the findings of an experiment are going to hold true. When we're conducting an experiment in a more laboratory kind of setting, a place that's highly controlled, um, we're looking for internal validity. In other words, if we keep repeating this experiment over and over and over, are we going to keep getting the same results? When we're thinking about outside of the lab, when we're thinking about the, the, the market or the field, we want our experiment to have external validity. In other words, 
is what we're finding in the lab going to be what we're going to find when we get out into the natural environment as well? Or is the highly controlled setting of our lab um, so unrealistic and contrived that when we get out into the actual uh, market that people are going to behave completely differently because um, they're, they're in a completely different situation? So a, a situation where we have high external validity is something where um, w whatever we've learned in our experiment is going to replicate uh, out in the wild, out in the market, out, out in the field. So I've actually combined the reasons and methods for causal research because a lot of causal research really is, uh, you know, focused on experiments. So first of all, we have what are called quasi-experiments. Now quasi-experiments, uh, some people also might call them pseudoscience or junk science. Um, quasi-experiments are when we conduct an experiment but we have no control group. So for example, um, if I want to test my candy bar sales, I can move my candy bars up to the front of the store and then just see if customers buy them more. And I don't have a control group to compare against. I don't have a, uh, a pre-test and a post-test. I just move my candy bars up to the front and see if people are buying more of them. And uh, if people do buy more of them, I assume that that means that candy bars sell better in that position. The problem with a quasi-experimental design is that I don't actually know why the candy bars are selling better. I can assume that it's because I moved them to a more visible location, um, but it might also be that during that time there is an advertisement campaign going on for uh, that particular brand of candy bar and it's making people crave it more. Or it could be that there uh, is an uh, internet meme that's going around that's talking about how great this candy bar is. Or it could be that um, because the candy bars are shiny, um, they have shiny packaging, and they're right under some lights that um, are really making them glow, people are seeing them more than they did in the, in the previous section, and that's why they're buying them. There could be all kinds of reasons to explain why the candy bars are selling better, and it's not necessarily just because we move them up front by the cash register. And in fact, um, a lot of times, when we come up with ideas about how the world works, we really do base them on a quasi-experimental design. We see something that works, and we try to replicate it, and then we're disappointed when it doesn't work out as well as it did the first time. Now, a laboratory experiment, and, and by the way, when I, when, when I say laboratory, you're probably thinking of like, you know, uh, like a chemistry lab, you know, with lots of beakers and um, Bunsen burners and things all over the place. But marketing research does have laboratory experiments. So a laboratory is just a place where we can control for as many extraneous variables as possible so that we can really focus just on the variables that we're either studying or, or manipulating uh, in our experimental design. And I'll give you a great example. So there is a, um, uh, a, a supermarket chain that used to be headquartered here, um, and we did some work for them, and um, they actually had a uh, simulated supermarket within their, um, their facility where they could test things out on consumers. So what they had was they had like a small test supermarket where they could put shelves up just like you would see them in a regular store and they could put real products up there and they could see how um, people in their laboratory responded to the placement of items. So for example if you put Honey Nut Cheerios at eye level and you put Cheerios up on top are the Honey Nut Cheerios going to sell better at eye level or, or will they sell better if they're lower and then the Cheerios are in the middle so people see the Cheerios and then they start looking for the Honey Nut Cheerios. You could look for things like that. You could replicate our candy bar example that I've been using in a, in a lab like that. Um, and the idea is in that lab, you're controlling the music, you're controlling the lighting, you're controlling the temperature, you're controlling the crowds, you're controlling the placement of every single thing so that you know exactly what it is that the experience is supposed to be like and what consumers are supposed to be looking at and, and, and measuring and testing for you so that you have no questions about any extraneous variables impacting their decisions. So a laboratory experiment generally is going to be conducted um, with a control group and with a one or more experimental groups. Not always, but, but usually. And, um, you know, again, in a laboratory experiment with a control group, what we would do is we would have the control group would go through a normal simulation and then we would modify something for the experimental group um, and then see what happens with the experimental group and how that, that change that we put into place affects their behavior. Now field experiments um, are often in marketing research done in the form of what we call test markets. And I'm sure you guys have heard the term. Uh, you probably have a rough idea of how test markets work, but um, they, they vary and they could be rather complicated or, or rather simple depending on uh, the design that you choose. So the basic idea of a test market is that 
instead of having a laboratory where we're controlling everything, we're gonna put products out into the wild and we're gonna see how they do. But we're gonna do so in a measured way where we have one group that is our control group and one or more groups that are our experimental groups and we're comparing how our products fare with those different groups. So for example, here in St. Louis, um, St. Louis, by the way, would be an excellent test market. It is, is an excellent test market because it's geographically uh, pretty far away from other cities. You have to drive three or more hours to get to other cities. Um, we have a pretty centralized media. You know, we don't have uh, media from other cities that, that really are impacting us. So all of our advertising here, it's pretty local. Um, and, and also, it's really easy to carve the St. Louis area up into distinct regions. So you can cut the St. Louis region in half um, by north or south or east or west or by zip codes or whatever. And um, you could say, okay, in half of the St. Louis region, we're going to introduce a new product. Uh, let's say candy bars again. So we're going to introduce a new candy bar, chocolate with nuts. And all of our other candy bars are just regular chocolate. Um, so we're going to int introduce chocolate with nuts and we're going to try to see if it sells um, better um, than we, you know, and, and without cannibalizing our own sales in this test market. And in the other, on the other market, we're not going to introduce that product at all and we're just going to see how our existing products fare. And by comparing those two test markets, we can get some information. First of all, we can see if people are buying the new chocolate with nuts variety of our candy bar at the expense of the ones that we're already selling and therefore we're just cannibalizing our products and uh, we're not actually gaining any market share in the product category and that's that's all good to know. We can also see if you know relative to our control group if we are actually selling more candy bars than we would expect to and uh, therefore our chocolate with nuts candy bar is either inspiring more candy purchases or maybe taking can uh, uh, taking candy purchases away from some of our competitors, which would be ideal if we're going to introduce a new product. So we can uh, gain an assessment of how well our product is going to do relative to what a normal environment would look like. Um, another thing that we could do is we could test advertising um, effectiveness. So we could roll out a test ad in one part of the city and um, see if that ad is having an effect on sales of whatever product that we're looking at, our, our candy bars in this example. Um, and then if in the other part of the city where we're not running those ads, if uh, the candy bars aren't selling as well. And there are all kinds of different uh, permutations and, permu uh, and, 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 and different uh, ideas around test marketing, some of which are, are, are about as simple as I just explained, and some of which can get very, very complicated. You can get into things like simulated test markets where using computer software to kind of simulate what a test market would do and all kinds of other ideas. The problem with test markets is that they're generally pretty expensive to administer. Um, you're putting your stuff out in the public so your competitors can see it, they can get an idea of what you're up to, and you also risk uh, antagonizing people a little bit. If they like your test market product and it doesn't meet your threshold uh, for success and you take it off the market, uh, people can get a little annoyed with you about that. So. Um, test marketing comes with its rewards and it also comes with its challenges and it also comes with its, its drawbacks that can actually um, make it something that you need to be very careful about rolling out. But the good news is that test markets um, conducted properly can give some really valuable information about um, whether or not a product is going to succeed or fail uh, based on what the smaller uh, microcosm of the larger marketplace uh, does in reaction to its presence. One other form of causal research, uh, actually many other forms of causal research, come under this category of advanced analytics. And these are a little different from um, the descriptive advanced analytics. These often require a PhD or higher. Um, you know, they're way, uh, they're, they're above my pay grade even, um, you know, as, a, as someone with a master's degree. Um, these are things that often require very, very specialized knowledge and that require um, a lot of detailed um, statistical ability and maybe even some computer programming knowledge in order to conduct, but they're really cool. And a lot of times they can um, construct these really, really sophisticated simulations or um, uh, predictive models, um, you know, things that are not that different from the models that are used to forecast the weather or to predict uh, the outcomes of uh, elections or things like that. They're very similar uh, in, in structure and in, and in scope. So there are some really neat tools out there that can come from uh, these advanced applications of causal research, but they are way outside the uh, realm of what we're going to be talking about in this class. With that said, 
We're going to move on to some final thoughts, and uh, hopefully you feel like you've learned quite a bit about causal research, but let me encourage you again, if you uh, have any questions, please refer to your textbook and the lecture notes because they go into even more detail and should give you some great ideas of how causal research is used and how it works.